here. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm glad to have you all here. I'm gonna move down to the bottom of the questions in case if you can't hear me, you can use the Q&A function to let me know as well. Um, so my name is Leslie gross Wurtson, and I'm a postdoc here at the Council on African Studies at Yale University. And I'm currently um, on campus here in New Haven, Connecticut, which is on the lands traditionally stewarded by the Quinnipiac people and invisible to you, but present in the building and in spirit, um, are Kristen Seibert, the program director for both the Councils of African and Middle East Studies, and Nora Langat, who is the program director for the Council on African Studies. And they're gonna be helping us field questions and keep me in line, um, you know, just keep us going. Uh, before I introduce Jennifer today, I want to give you a sense of the structure for this conversation. So I've prepared some questions and we'll have a conversation with Jennifer regarding her past and current work. And please feel free throughout the discussion to write questions in the Q&A and we'll try to get through as many of them as possible. If not during um, the first half of our conversation, then during the second half. So I fully intend to shut up at about minute 30 and let you have an opportunity to have a discussion and ask those questions. Um, one of the goals of these discussions that we're hosting here in the council is to connect scholars, activists, and other interested people who are on the continent as well as in North America and other places across the world. So we're really excited to have you and, and looking forward to your participation. And um, I wanna take just one moment right now to acknowledge um, or to bring into this space an awareness and an expression of solidarity with the people in Nigeria who are fighting against police brutality, something that is, um, you know, uh, has its roots, I think, in some of the colonial processes that we might be talking about today and is also a struggle that is really real and meaningful in my country as well. And so we just remember those people today and express our care and solidarity for them. All right, um, I'm gonna introduce Jennifer now. So Jennifer is an associate professor of history at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, where she teaches courses on African history, world history, history of technology, urban history. I think you're seeing a theme in history here, um, digital humanities and historical communication. Her first book, Ghana on the Go, African Mobility in the Age of Motor Transportation was published by Indiana University Press in 2016. And it was a finalist for the African Studies Association Book Prize in 2017. Um, and it's really, I, I highly recommend it. Cover, very cool. Um, go out and get it. Uh, an active public scholar, and this is something I hope that we are able to talk about today. Um, she's published in a wide variety of venues, including the Washington Post, Africa as a Country, The Conversation, Nursing Clio, Clio and the Contemporary, The Metropole and History at Work. And she's an active, uh, active on a number of digital platforms, including Instagram, Twitter, and um, I think you have several blogs going at this point. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Um, her work obviously also appears in numerous academic journals and edited collections, most recently appearing in technology and culture. So Jennifer, I'm really glad to have you. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. All right, so we'll get started. Um, your first book, Ghana on the Go, looks at how automobility, this, this is my interpretation, <laughs> feel free to correct me, but how automobility shaped Ghana, both so socially, culturally, and materially, really from the late 19th century all the way to the present, but you, you know, you really focus until the, the 1990s. Um, I really appreciated, as a, as a migration scholar, I really appreciated centering mobility as central to these questions of politics, um, economics, and economic development, and so on especially because I think that mobility um, does occupy such a central role in the lives of Ghanaians and all of us for that matter. And yet it really is something that's overlooked. We think of um, our getting from point A to point B as something that, that is dead time or things aren't happening in that time. And I, I really like that you brought, um, that you showed how the development of Ghana uh, really happens in those spaces, right? Between point A and point B. 
so anyway, I just want to invite you to tell us a little bit more about the book and maybe how you came to this project in the first place. Uh, yeah, I guess I can I can start with the latter part and it'll get me to the uh, to the former. So. Uh, you know, I, I started, um, and many of you who maybe you're just, may, I know some of you are PhD research um, students now. I, there's friends on the list, so I, I see you there. Um, and, and some of you, you know, may well have already gone through this process. You know, you go to the field, you have an idea of what you want to research, um, and then you realize that it's not possible. Uh, so I, I went to the field wanting to research uh, the kind of public culture of religion in Ghana. Um, which is a thing, um, but was difficult to research historically. Um, and I was in a history program. Um, I do uh, also have a lot of training in anthropology, and um, but but I ultimately needed to write a history dissertation. <laughs> um, and uh, so, in the process of doing that, I mean, I was very interested in the um, in the signs that you see on shops and on um, vehicles um, that at that time were overwhelmingly religious. They're a little less so now. Um, actually significantly less so now, uh, but at the time were really, really prominently religious. And, um, and so in the, in the process of doing some preliminary field work for that, I talked to some people and I, I write about this in the introduction to the book. Um, and I, in particular, I, I talked to an older driver um, who worked at the Atomic Junction taxi rank, for those of you who are familiar with Ghana. And um, he started telling me about his experience as a driver and how he came to driving and what his life was like. And his life, his experience as a driver connected him to, um, it connected him to, uh, you know, the Ghana's Africa Cup of Nations win right after independence. For example, he, he as a driver, he played on a team and got recognition um, and as a result made it to the national team along with his brother. Um, he also, as a driver, participated in escorting, uh, you know, um, prominent leaders from across the continent um, to the the kind of major um, conference that Kwame Nkrumah held right, right after independence. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was interesting to think about how this person who in, in Ghana and uh, for pretty much anybody would be seen as a, a kind of minor figure in terms of social and political importance had been so closely connected to things that were crucial um, to the political and social and cultural and economic life of the nation. And um, as I looked, very little had ever been written about this. Um, there was a little bit about um, Trotro slogans, but it was mostly categorizing them. Um, and it didn't really dive a lot deeper than that. And, um, and so I, I went back, I wrote a proposal and I went back to, uh, to do that research. Um, one of the things that I was particularly interested in was, was how automobility shaped Ghana, but also how Ghana sh and Ghanaians shaped automobility. So, so one of the main arguments of the book, really, it tries to push against narratives of automobility and, and narratives of technology that assume that technology has inherent meaning, um, that it carries that meaning with it, social and cultural meaning with it everywhere, and that it's determinate um, or determinative, that it, it, it's, yeah, that, that you have no choice and that people who engage with that, that, that technology are appropriating it, are merely appropriating it, or inc incorporating it into their lives um, and adjusting as a result. And, and what I found was that that often wasn't true, um, that, that Ghanaians um, were, were always, or very often, you know, using motor vehicles in ways that completely defied European British expectations for what an automobile was, um, and certainly very different than the way that Americans thought about automobiles. Um, and, and that had real consequences. It was, it was a, it was a sort of resistance, um, a form of decolonization well before there was decolonization. Um, you know, they, they created an industry in defiance of the colonial administration, grew that industry, um, you know, resisted multiple attempts to thwart it, um, slayed all competitors between the railway and a municipal bus service and everything else um, and continue to be incredibly important in the country. And to this day, I mean, just more recently, I've been writing about 
the bus rapid transit system that has most recently failed in Ghana. Um, and uh, that's, that's yet another example, right, of, the, of government and development agencies assuming that transportation needs to look a certain way um, and imposing those visions on the city and drivers and, and residents saying, no, that's, <laughs> that's not actually um, what we need and that's not how life works here. Um, or what our priorities are. And so, so that, that is really interesting to me. And so I, um, to do that, I, I took a lot of, I listened very carefully to drivers themselves and, and collected hundreds of interviews with older drivers in particular, um, who started driving in the 1930s and 1940s. And they had amazing stories, mm. um, really amazing stories. And, and they were located, um, they, they also change a narrative of the city of Accra, I think, um, like a popular narrative, at least, um, that says that like people, that Ga people, um, people who live in La or people who live in the old parts of the city are um, uh, aggressive and mean. And uh, I mean, it's a, it's a terrible stereotype, but I was told when I first started doing research that I should not go to law alone. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that I, I, it would not be okay for me to go there. And they are lovely. Um, you know, everybody there was, was incredibly wonderful and lovely and wanted to tell their stories. And they had been so central to the development of this system mm -hmm. um, and continue to be today. So um, they had these rich, interesting stories and and their occupation was really central to their identity it was they that was who they were um and i would ask them why they did what they did and they, they would say it's in my heart um that which you don't hear people say very often um that that's sort of like you know i do this because it is who i am i felt a calling right it's, it was almost vocational um to them so that was interesting too um, and I think a very different way of talking about labor than we normally do in African studies, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a little unfortunate. Like it, it tends, labor, labor studies tend to be very kind of transactional um, and, and kind of, yeah, economic, right? Uh, but but there, there's, there's an effective dimension to this that I think is really important that came out in their interviews that, that I really wanted to highlight as well. Yeah, and I think a collective dimension right like there was definitely I mean not just the sort of driver apprentice or mate relationship but these you know all of these sort of collective um at one point I think you I think early on uh you know maybe in the 30s or 40s you said something like um you know one trotro might have 25 registered drivers or something like that and it's a whole it's just a really different way of imagining um what automobility looks like. And I really like, um, we don't have the visual for us right now, but I really like the way that you split that word up and you talk about auto slash mobility and thinking really intentionally about autonomy and how mobility um, is related or intimately bound up in autonomy and how that's also that hype or that, what is that called? That thing. Slash. Anyway, slash. <laughs> How that slash is also the site of a lot of contest, like in political struggle, of, you know, people wanting to be mobile so they can be autonomous. Um, I really, I thought that that was really fascinating. Um, I just wanted to bring up a couple things based on what you said uh, that struck me. One was particularly in the development of um, automobility in Ghana. One was this idea that um, you're not doing a comparative of the U.S., but you mentioned it a little bit in the er in the early part of the book, and I kept kind of thinking about that as it went through. And one was this idea that um, you know uh, the the car in the United States and sort of um, Henry Ford's vision was emblematic of this rise of industrial capitalism or the zenith maybe of industrial capitalism in the United States and also consumer culture, but in Ghana, it would actually symbolize something totally different. And it wasn't the car, but the trotro that occupied that space. And it has to do with entrepreneurial capitalism. And I, that distinction, I think, was really fascinating um, for me and resonated a lot with how I've understood um, some, of the, some of those processes in West and Central Africa. Um, yeah. Anyway, I thought that was really interesting, and I'll let you respond to that in, in a second. And then... Um, 
the other thing related to that was how you talked about, so you just said it isn't just about automobility shaping Ghana, but also how Ghanaians shaped automobility. And one of the ways that that came out that, that was really interesting was um, in the construction of roads and um, who constructed roads and for what purposes and who was held responsible. Uh, I thought that that was really fascinating. And I thought maybe you might wanna respond to one or both of those yeah. things uh, as well. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, definitely, I think automobility and the notion of autonomy and mobility separately are were really central to the 20th century liberal project. Um, and and I think Americans and the British and other parts other parts of Western Europe were were implicated in that or, or embraced that in various ways. Um, and the automobile was central to it in different ways, a little different for the British than for the Americans, but all the same. Um, and, and yeah, I think, I think, you know, we make so many assumptions, especially as Americans, we make so many assumptions about what autonomy and mobility mean and how they're connected to technology and how they're connected to the car um, and, and to liberalism and, and to all sorts of things that are just not true everywhere in the world. And, and so, yeah, the, um, the connection to, or the, that idea that the trotro and the, you know, certainly entrepreneur, entrepreneurial um, capitalism or entrepreneurial kind of economics and um but also it's very social right it was it was about facilitating community mm -hmm. and expanding access to mobility for people who didn't have um necessarily the means to own their own car um and it recognized that there were relationships involved in mobility right that um that people didn't move by themselves they moved in um, often, right? Um, mm -hmm. they, they almost always moved in collaboration or in partnership with other people. Um, and, and they didn't want to end that, right? Just because an automobile came didn't mean that suddenly people wanted to cut ties. Mm -hmm. um, that stuff was still really important. It shifted, but it didn't completely end, right? Mm -hmm. um, so all those things are frameworks that help shape the way that people think about um, the way, the way that people think about technology, right? The way that they, they give it meaning and, and use it. Um, I'm trying to, I, I just lost your second question though. That's okay. Cause I just looked at the clock and I, I, I'm rigorously giving myself seven more minutes. So <laughs> someone asked Jennifer about it during your 30 minutes, but I'm going to move on because <laughs> there's other things I want to talk about. So, um, you, yeah, so the title, now I don't have it in front of me, but um, I think you sent us a title that had to do with placemaking and informality um, in the relationship to colonial power. And so I was wondering if you um, wanted to talk about that project, maybe connecting it to the previous project. Um, I, I sense that there was, there's a trajectory there, um, but I wanna make sure that you have a chance to introduce that project as well and give us a chance to hear about that. Yeah, thanks. Um... That's, I, I'm remembering your other question now and it's, it helps connect. So um, <laughs> I was inspired uh, to do this project in many ways by um, the kind of politics around infrastructure and, and road building in Ghana um, and, and the ways that, um, you know, kind of externally imposed visions, um, expert visions of what the city should look like often didn't account in any way for local realities or local values. Um, and, and that people really did respond uh, by creating their own forms of infrastructure by, you know, that, that, you know, the British often assumed when they came into cities like Accra and European colonial powers in general um, and American colonial powers <laughs> and as they expanded in the US um, assumed when they encountered people in, in that had kind of spatial um, understandings that were differed from their own that, that that they weren't organized at all that they didn't have infrastructure that they didn't have technology that they didn't have um, any form of planning and that's not true mm -hmm. and so um, this new project uh, which I hope to have a draft of at the end of the year uh, is about the history of planning um, more or less kind of broadly construed, right? So, um, so public health, um, public health infrastructure, housing. Um, in uh, the first half of the 20th century in Accra, and, and really thinking about how regulation 
became the way that people, the way that um, colonial administrations effectively marginalized Africans mm -hmm. in order to create space for their own activities mm -hmm. in the city and to impose their own visions of what the city and its future would look like. Um, and that, I argue, is the beginning of a process of informalization. So, so you know, the British aren't necessarily using the word informal economy, right? And this is a relatively modern construction, thanks, <laughs> Keithart. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it has roots much farther back. And, and I think that, um, so, so one of the points of this project is to push all of us um, who use this term to really think about its history and how it came to be. Um, and to be careful about the way that we deploy it in the present and to think and, and how we think about um, activities or um, parts of the city that are um, are classified as informal currently and maybe to reframe their role in the development process and there's a lot of innovation in those spaces and that particularly right now is we're facing increasing precarity and all sorts of things you know various kinds of collapse of of capitalism and um, you know difficulties with building infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. That there's you know there's a there's a lot of there's a lot that we need to learn that modernism is not helping us with. Right. Yeah. yeah. And what I think you showed in in your previous book, and probably there's other examples in this project, but um, you know it was just the the ways in which informality wasn't an absence of the colonial state, but it was. Um, an art of government within the colonial state, right? From road gaps, which I understand to be they just like left gaps between connecting roads. Well, you know, they would like break up the road. That it yeah, so that people could not, you know, so people had to make their own road. They had to either make their roads from scratch or they had to fill those gaps or find other ways around. Um, and that was, it really was a process of like governance and resistance or particular, you know, uh, mechanisms of control. Uh, and that was, I think that was a really interesting way, or that was a way, I think I'm a geographer, so I think about that in terms of um, what Ananya Roy has talked about in terms of regulation and permitting, but it was really interesting to think about the material ways that the, the, the um, uh, you know, the colonial state tried to interrupt people's right to, to infrastructure, uh, and, and the informality was a resist, res, resistance to that, in, informality, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I think this has such huge implications right now. Um, you know, with this, with the conversation around the sustainable development goals, there's, there's a lot of conversation about informality and a lot of taking seriously in some ways, um, more than ever before, um, the informal economy and informal housing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I have real concerns about, um, and I think a lot of other people do too, about about the idea that we just incorporate them, we we formalize mm -hmm. the informal and incorporate them into the formal system. I think that ignores this history of of violence, um, of of kind of regula regulatory violence and spatial violence that isn't going to change anything. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, the system itself is is profoundly problematic in a way that we're having a conversation in the US, right? right. Um, around around race and, and racial and racial justice issues. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's no different. And yeah. I think we just have to be way more careful and, and really look at the, the historical roots of that. Amen. <laughs> so I have one minute. I'm gonna ask the question and then I at the same time I'm going to invite uh, you attendees to please ask questions or follow up. Um, something that I am not going to be able to ask about is uh, Jennifer's digital humanities uh, sort of engagement and the way she engages with publics both in Ghana and elsewhere. Um, but I did, I guess, I guess this question, the last question I want to ask um, does get to this and this is like kind of a big, big question. You can take it how you want. Um, so one of the reasons I was excited to talk to you today is because I feel like you have a thoughtful perspective on what it means to be a non-African Africanist um, and also the ways that research needs to be engaged in the continent. I heard you talk about, um, you know, not just bringing the research home to local community, but there has to be something more than that. Um, and in general, you know, you describe yourself as an activist public scholar. So I was wondering if maybe you wanted to talk about that and, and what that really looks like for you. Yeah, I think, um, I, I think doing, 
doing African studies work to me has never been about trying to own the continent in any way. Um, and I don't think that I get any special privilege. Um, and I, I strongly resist um, various kinds of special privilege um, for being an outsider. It's hard, it's hard to avoid, it just happens. But um, I, I think, you know, because it happens, um, and because that structure is so connected to the colonial project um, and to the colonial roots of all of our fields, we owe it. I mean, it's 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 to me, it's an ethical um, requirement to actively work to create alternative possibilities, um, to to work actively in collaboration with with scholars um, on the continent to. Um, you know, to ensure that the projects that you're doing are valuable to the communities that are affected. They're not just driven by Western theory um, mm -hmm. or, or scholarly, you know, whatever. Um, so, you know, my book wasn't a book that was uh, written to try to win awards. It was a book that was important to the people and, and, it's, and its shape and its structure and, and its content was, was something that, that was important to the people that, that I spoke to. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, several of my collaborators are in the participants list uh, today. Thank you guys for being here. Um, you know, I think, you know, being, being open to and actively committed to the idea of decolonizing knowledge, intellectual decolonization is really important. That, that work of, of kind of fundamentally interrogating our, our concepts that, that we bring to our field, that we bring to research, that we bring um, to practice are, are really essential. And I guess I think, you know, it's, it's not up to me to tell Ghanaians what's important, but what I can do is tell Americans and Europeans what they need to consider. Mm -hmm. um, and I can push them in ways that, you know, on, in situations where they're perpetuating violence mm -hmm. um, or damage, I can push um, so I think, you know, I, I, have, I said this, um, in a conference a couple of years ago, you know, I think, um, we have to be able as historians and it's uncomfortable for historians, really uncomfortable for a lot of historians, uh, maybe this is my anthropologist side coming out, but, um, you know, I really do think that we have to be able to think about our, the impact of our work. And, um, I really think that we, we have to be able, um, you know, if, if we're writing histories of development or histories of technology or histories of infrastructure, who do we want to read it? And, and, and what, what difference should it make for them? And we should be able to articulate that. I mean, if we don't understand the histories of those fields and, and how, they, how they practice in the present, then we're probably missing something for starters in our own analysis. Um, but I think we're also missing a really important opportunity to check our own people mm. and, um, and to do important work that um, intervenes. And so, uh, you know, most recently I've, um, I've done a takeover of the, um, the Architects Project um, Instagram site and um, explained a lot of this new work um, there and had a lot of architects following along, which was great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think um, I, I write to with and collaborate with engineers and urban planners um, you know, we, we do collaborative and interdisciplinary work thinking about, you know, alternative planning education and, um, and other sorts of things, right? And try to bring... That looks like alternative planning education, because I think that's really interesting. Yeah, um, we're working on it. Uh, <laughs> we're working on a model. Um, there will probably be a virtual conference or a virtual um, panel uh, in uh, next year in Detroit. But um, the... The idea is that, um, you know, if, if, as I've been arguing, uh, you know, contemporary planning, historical planning practices are deeply rooted in the colonial project, then we really have to rethink how people approach planning. Um, and that, that includes conversations with engineers and with, with kind of um, material scientists and with, you know, all sorts of other people, um, but and geographers and other folks. Um, so, so we have an interdisciplinary team and we, we have um, had a number of workshops, um, one in Nigeria, one in Malawi, um, 
we were supposed to have one in Ghana, uh, but it didn't happen. Um, and, um, you know, there's lots of, lots of practitioners there and we have conversations about, you know, some of the, some of the endemic challenges, right? If, if these challenges don't go away, but we keep doing the same thing, then what, what do we need to do to reframe our practice? Mm -hmm. I mean, what kinds of tools might fields that aren't normally included in that conversation have um, and what kinds of insights might they have to help us understand that better? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm a big advocate for um, rigorous interdisciplinarity and um, interdisciplinary collaboration and um, particularly across um, STEM and non-STEM fields and really strongly encourage people um, who work in any of these kinds of areas to, um, you know, to reach out to folks in those areas. They, they're really interested, mm. right? Engineers are actually super interested in, <laughs> in this. Um, they just have no idea and it's not part of their education at all. Like, likewise with planners, mm -hmm. um, they're just not educated to think about things in this way. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we're creating uh, an alternative curriculum. We're still trying to work out what that looks like. Um, it's a bit critical planning, but it's, um, but it's a lot of stuff outside of planning altogether. Mm. Um, so ethnographic work, um, you know, teaching planners how to do ethnography, um, you know, the, and history, <laughs> the history matters too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, I think that's really key. And it's, it's something, you know, it's, yeah, like I said, I, I don't think of myself as an activist in terms of like, I'm going to go out and yell at people and tell them, you know, what to do. But I think this form of, of work is a kind of activism as well. And I think it's, it's kind of imperative to those of us who are white and in the, in the academy. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. It, in partnership with our colleagues on the continent, of course. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I didn't warn Jennifer ahead of time I was going to ask any of these questions, so she's doing great. Um, does anybody have any questions that they want to submit right now? Okay, uh, I'll read Thomas's question. Um, so he says, Accra has been sprawling considerably over the past 30 years, partly due to wealthier people moving to larger plots of land on the edge of the city as is happening globally. And especially in COVID, like right now, it's crazy, on, on, at least in my part of the world. <laughs> um, do you think attitudes to Trotros and Accra reflect this class divide? Um, I do in a lot of ways. Um, I think uh, actually Kukwa who's here in the, uh, or was here at least, I can't, I'm not looking at the participant list right now, but uh, we were having a conversation on Twitter this morning about how um, people who have private cars and have air conditioned private cars in particular and air conditioned homes and can afford to go to elite cafes um, really live in a world separate from the world of everything else. And um, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, if you're commuting from, like at this point, people in a car are living all the way out, like, my God, like, in, like they're living in Insawan, they're living, they're living like uh, places that were never considered part of Accra. It was like a giant hike to get there. Um, and, you know, so a lot of people who move there um, absolutely do have private cars and they absolutely do use um, their kind of private car privilege to critique um, Mm. critique trotros um that's a bigger problem um that, that's not that existed before the sprawl necessarily um so I, i'll say that um you know in the in the lead up to the to the bus rapid transit plan and and in every single plan for something like this before it um because there's been many many um that have failed um for the same reasons mm -hmm. and uh you know in in all of them, there's been this kind of inherent assumption that private car ownership is the best thing mm. and should be privileged. And there's an assumption that trotros and taxis are bad and are the problem. Uh, what's interesting- The danger around that, right? Like that yeah. they're causing a lot of accidents and things like that. Yeah, and, and to some degree it's, uh, you know, the way they, pick up and drop off people um 
It's also people, uh, you know, driving a bit aggressively. Um, but, you know, it, it's interesting because if you actually look at the statistics in Accra today, 85% of the city's mobile residents are travel in Trotros, which account for only 15% of road traffic. Wow. <laughs> so if you want to talk about traffic congestion, <laughs> Right. I don't think that trotos are probably, you know, your biggest target. I think you probably are going to want to try to convince um, more people to to, you know, give up their private cars. The big challenge with that is that they're probably not going to. Um, that there's this value attached to private car ownership because of this kind of American kind of Western um, value, but also just, a, a, there's also a Ghanaian value to some degree um, in some parts of Ghana that, um, you know, and, and frankly, I mean, it is nicer, right? It's like to be able to ride around in air conditioning, fair enough. If, you know, as soon as I could afford it, I started to do it too. Um, but, you know, I think it's, you know, building a bus system that is air conditioned is not going to get people to give up their car. Instead, it's just going to marginalize, again, Trotro drivers that do actually provide an essential service for people. Um, I think what's also important about the sprawl is that a lot of people who are moving outside of the city, so there are those elite developments, but there's also a lot of people who live outside the city because they cannot afford land inside the city. Um, they can't afford property. They can't afford rent. The housing is very, very expensive. It's increased dramatically over the last 10 or 15 years. And um, so, you know, it, you know, a lot of people that I know who have a car, um, you know, say, I can't afford to drive my car in all the way from where I live to Accra because it uses too much petrol. So I have to leave it at home and I take a trotro. Okay. And so it's, it's not necessarily classed. I mean, it is and it isn't. Right. That's interesting. Have, yeah. Uh, please feel free to submit more questions. I'll have a follow-up to that. What, what did Trotro drivers want? Or like, like how would they articulate the sort of service provision or support from the government um, that might resolve some of the traffic issues and you know those sorts of things today. Yeah, so we've actually been working with them um, for several years to to come up with some alternative plans mm -hmm. for um, support of the Chortro sector that would be um, that would address some of the most prominent passenger complaints, which are largely superficial, to be honest. It's like they're crowded, the vehicles aren't in good condition. Um, you know, the, the mates smell, they're uneducated, like um, these sorts of things. Um, the, so the drivers actually, I mean, they don't like it either, right? They don't like those passenger complaints. They wish that they didn't have to, you know, operate under these conditions in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, there's always exceptions to that, of course, but, um, you know, I, so many of them have really great thoughtful ideas about how to rebuild their lorry parks, for example. Um, to provide services or um, the kinds of support that they would need from government in order to maintain their vehicles or, um, you know, the, yeah, I mean, like at present, they get no support. Mm -hmm. And um, since the 1960s and 1970s, they've been explicitly criminalized right. um, increasingly, um, as, as my book argues. So it's, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's been a long, slow decline. It wasn't always like this, right? Um, these, these were all, these used to be in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. These were people who were um, highly respected in their communities. In economically mobile jobs, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, they were cool. They were, uh, you know, they had money. Women loved them, as many of the popular songs of the era say. Uh, you know, they, um, they were really they were highly respected and um it's it's a shame i think that um that there's this kind of dismissal but we're we're making some some efforts mm -hmm. um, so this is from malika who who has a caveat that i don't think is necessary malika it's uh, she missed a little bit from connectivity 
So she said, I have a question about what you said earlier about the Trotro industry as a sort of resistance to how automobiles were intended and the power they yield to squash competitors like the rapid bus transit. As an Accra resident and Trotro user, I wonder how much you consider the reliance on and dominance of Trotros as, um, as the result of state failure, since Trotros are not the most convenient or most comfortable transport means. Yeah, no, I, I think I think it's a it's a really important question, Malika. And um, you know, you're right. The the Trotros are the result of. <laughs> Um, of state failure. But I also think that it's um, important to consider that maybe those drivers developed a system that really does work in certain ways for people in a way that a bus system wouldn't. Um, so, so I think there's reasons why when a bus system is introduced that it's not popular. <laughs> you know, that it, it ends up failing, people won't take it. Um, they're slow right? Um, more people are on them, so they have to stop more often. Um, you know, even the bus rapid transit system, um, it was impossible. They actually ended up not being able to construct a bus rapid transit system because they couldn't create distinct lanes, um, which is necessary for a, def for a, rap a BRT system by definition. Um, so instead, it's a, a quality bus system. Um, and that's because of, of the width of the roads and, and how closely to the roads people have, have built over the years. I mean, that's really hard to address, right? It would take enormous amounts of money. Um, you know, but I, I do think there's something about also the, um, the kind of social dynamics and the way that people um, move in the city. So I, I've just been really interested in thinking about the responses that people give to surveys about how they feel about trotros, and when you read past the, like the comfort issues, which are sig which are significant, right? Um, I don't. It's yeah. I've cut myself many times and sweated and you know had dust in my face and probably took several years off my life from um, uh, from inhaling exhaust. Um, so I, I don't minimize that at all. There's definitely things that need to be addressed. Um, but I think the convenience question is interesting because when you ask people, for example, as, pe as people have recently done, researchers have recently done with, you know, why they don't take the BRT and they take Trotro instead, is, is they say it's, it's actually more convenient. Um, it, it runs more often. It runs closer to where I need to go. Um, it gets closer to my house or closer to the market or closer to my office or whatever. Um, it... Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, these sorts of things are challenging uh, because I think, you know, I was I was recently in a um, a webinar with Ankel Gupta who was who was talking about um, the issue of maintenance, and I I said, you know, what do you what do you do with maintenance? How do you talk about maintenance in a situation where the infrastructure was intentionally incomplete in the first place mm. when it was never meant to function properly? Right. And he was like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, he's like, I hope you're working on that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's hard. I think it's a hard question, but I think it requires a lot of new ways to think about what transport could be um, and how it looks in the city. And I think it has a lot of implications for cities like Detroit. So I think Trotro is actually an excellent model um, for thinking about um, how we could provide transportation in cities like Detroit. Mm -hmm. And that kind of conversation might help us um, think in different ways about Trotros also, maybe. I like that. I think also, um, I'll add a little comment and then we'll move to Marius, uh, just that um, what I appreciate about about the way that you approach these questions, I think you do in some ways approach it ethnographically, or maybe we'll broaden it and say empirically <laughs> so that the history part gets included. And I like thinking about the new, you talk about new ways of thinking, but I think you're actually also talking about looking at what's already in place and not thinking only in terms of replacement, right? But also, um, uh, you know, appreciating and looking at the particular historic social 
other contextual uh, relations that are already in place and how can those be drawn on and learned from and you know all of those things. So I think that that seems like a really important lesson for planners and other people, well, for all of us, right? Yeah. When I made a shout out to um, you know some some really thoughtful, amazing young Danaeans um, who've been doing this work um, and and opening businesses and doing projects. Um, so I, I work in collaboration with Nano Sequejo um, on his Trotro Life, which is an Instagram embedded art project. Um, you know, rethinking, kind of reshaping the way that we talk about and think about Trotros and trying to add some context and perspective. Um, a lot of the business owners, I've been really, I've been really inspired personally by by looking at the ways that they have uh, have kind of taken up local products and re envisioned them um, in new ways. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you're seeing all kinds of stuff on the market now that you you never saw uh, before food products and all kinds of other things. Um, so there's this there's this new um, energy and pride around being in Accra and being in Ghana. Um, Canadians have always been very proud, but it's um, it's it's being articulated differently, I think. Um, so this this notion of like a Krawi day, which is a, a a podcast and a website and other things, but and a, a saying that people say like we're here. Um, that idea, like we we embody a craw, right? They're really taking that seriously. So I find that really inspiring, personally. That's cool. Um, so Marius has a question. She said, thank you for talking with us about your work. I'm interested in if or how gender dynamics shape the story of transportation and mobility in Accra. Do people view and talk about men and women's mobility differently? Yeah, that's a really great question, Marius. Um, I think, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, you know, drivers, were almost exclusively men. Um, women were passengers. Women did, however, own vehicles often because they were often traders. Um, so they might own the vehicle, but they wouldn't drive it. There's a few exceptions to that, but by and large. And so what was interesting, right, um, is that I would ask people, um, I would ask drivers, you know, I would try to get at this question of gender. They didn't bring it up very much. I think just because it was so taken for granted that um, the driving was gendered male, that it wasn't, it didn't kind of figure very prominently in their understanding of masculinity or, or whatever, at least not the way they talked to me. Maybe if, if somebody else went and talked to them, they'd get a different answer. But um, I, I think, you know, what was interesting, I would kind of push, right? And, and I would say, but, you know, driving is like, you know, women, women carry very heavy loads on their head over very long distances. Um, you know, that's very difficult work and they do farm labor and they do other things. Um, you know, why can't they drive? Because they would always say that driving is, is hard, right? You had to be tough. And they were like, no, it's not possible. <laughs> and, um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's probably multiple reasons for that, but um, some of it is about the relationship between between traders and the people that transported their goods, um, that's a bit more historical and not not directly connected to to transport. Um, but I mean, you see it with um, with people who drive their own cars as well. So today, um, people will talk about you know women who drive private cars as being terrible drivers, like overwhelmingly. They say it, people talk about it all the time, um, and you know, generally the conversation is about women who are traders being mobile and there's not a lot of other, um, not a lot of other conversation or women who are going back and forth to the market. So the, the primary form of mobility is women going, interacting with the market. Mm. Um, you know, the men, there's a much broader set of things. So they would talk about, you know, entertainment and they would talk about going to work and they would talk about, um, you know, they would talk about traveling, um, you know, outside of the city and they would, you know, various things, but, but, um, the women that I talked to pretty exclusively, um, and the men that talked about female, female passengers, um, pretty exclusively talked about traders or, or people going to the market. Um, so that's really interesting, right? Um, but the other, the other thing 
and again, this goes to gender stereotypes. So I don't want to reify anything or or make people think that I think this is true. Um, but but the thing that people would say over and over again, male drivers would say over and over again, is that um, women were not um, didn't have the sort of constitution to deal with passengers. They got angry too easily um, and could insult people. Um, and that to be a driver, you had to be patient and um, you had to know how to how to work with um, how to work with others, and and you had to be able to kind of suck it up if somebody was being terrible to you, um, and they did not think that women did that. Um, you know, again, I think that's very much a gender stereotype and is probably profoundly unfair, mm -hmm. um, but. You know, it was it very much shaped the way that people thought about it, and it's only really now that we're seeing more female trotro drivers um, in the sector, and think, it's still a small number. And historically, I think what's interesting is that these roads, in the first place, because of the refusal of the state, the colonial state, to develop them, they actually followed women head carrier paths, right? So, in in a lot of ways, women shaped the 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 or, or were they imprinted the map of, of mobility that roads kind of followed. And so that's like an interesting di dynamic over the like historical. Yeah, they were some of the first, um, some of the first vehicle owners. They were, you know, they, they played a really important role in the growth of the industry um, in ways that people don't really talk about at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And I'll just give someone 30 seconds to type one up or otherwise I'll ask one myself. Um, okay, so I'll so I'll go ahead and ask a question. Um, I'm trying to make it small. <laughs> um, you know, something that you said, I, I in in terms of your engagement um, as a scholar and really thinking about, you know, the colonial um, like power knowledge that informs all of our disciplines. Oh wait, so we have, uh, oh, well, I'll, I'll ask these two questions and then you can do what you want with them. Um, made me wonder, my experience, my limited experience in the classroom has been that students are actually really interested in mining some of these colonial histories and really understanding how they intrude on the present. And I was just wondering about what you do with students in the classroom at Wayne State um, and how they're engaging with those things, and maybe also how they're relating to their own lives. I mean, you're in Detroit, which has its own history of automobility. Um, so that so that's kind of maybe a question you might want to end on. Um, but but just quickly, Tracy wanted to know a little bit more about the female attendance. Is that like the mates in yeah. the Chotros um, in in the contemporary period? And and if you have something to say about those? Yeah, Tracy. I mean, I think. Um... It's interesting because um, that's that's kind of the gateway, right? Um, that's that's how people enter driving, and so it, it makes sense that they they became and, and are becoming female mates um, quicker than they're becoming drivers. I also think that says a lot about um, people's willingness to trust a car, a vehicle, to a female driver. Mm. So they'll you know they'll hire them as a, take them on as a mate or an apprentice, but they won't give them necessarily ownership. Of a v not ownership, but but responsibility for a vehicle potentially. I'm not sure. I haven't done enough research on that, so it would be a really, um, in like in the present. Um, so it would be a really interesting question to look at. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's um, there's a lot of really great interviews with some of those female mates that um, where they where they talk about it. And um, yeah, I, re I recommend like you know, just googling it and checking it out because they're um, they're really thoughtful about what they're doing. Um, the, oh, now I'm forgetting your question. I'm sorry. Uh, just about how you, um, talk about sort of the colonial history oh, in the classroom. Class. Yes, yes, yes. Your yes. students respond. Yes. Um, that's a, it's a great question. And, um, the, yeah, the students in Detroit are very well aware of the limits of capitalism and its failures. And many of them, many of my students live in the city and they're from the city and they're particularly from neighborhoods that have been disinvested in um, or, or seen disinvestment. Um, 
and intentional neglect and spatial violence. And, and so they're very well aware of this. Um, they're interested, very interested to know that this is part of a global process, that these are global ideas. Um, and they're also really excited to think about possibilities that are alternatives, right? So a bus rapid, things like bus rapid transit are being imposed all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, they were attempting to introduce one in Detroit as well. Um, and so, you know, with planning students, for example, I have a conversation with them where I talk to them about why the BRT has failed in Accra and give them historical examples and talk about the kind of values attached to, um, to mobility and urban mobility in particular and kind of spatial issues and, and then ask them whether, um, ask them to reflect on what that means in Detroit. And, and they're always like, Detroit needs trotros. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think they get, they get really excited about it. Um, so there is absolutely a ton of possibility there. Um, and I think, I think students want that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, well, thank you. This has been a wonderful conversation and I appreciate you taking the time to be here and talk to us and to all the people, the participants, people who ask questions, people who listened um, from all over. I just am really grateful for this as well. Um, yeah, it's been wonderful. So stay tuned for future uh, Yale Council of African Studies uh, talks and keep an eye on Jennifer Hart's work. I'm excited about I'm excited about what's coming. Thanks so much, everybody. All right. Bye. <laughs>